Hi everyone, up next we have our wonderful friends over at Panthera uh, talking a little bit about their organization. For the ones that don't know them, Panthera is a non-profit organization that focuses exclusively on the conservation and protection of the world's 40 wildcat species and their ecosystems. They have different efforts all over the world and they have an amazing project called the Jaguar Corridor Initiative that protects the Jaguar habitats across several countries in Latin America. At Latinx in Gaming, we know the importance of giving back and that is why we decided to partner with them for Unidos Online in their efforts to take care of these amazing animals that live in our lands. So if you can, uh, they could really use your help. So follow them on social media or donate in our donation campaign for Unidos Online below. <laughs> Hi, I'm Esteban Payan, the Panthera's Regional Director for South America. We're delighted to start working with the gaming community using these transformative and cutting edge tools to forward our mission, which is saving the world's 40 species of wildcats. We focus on the biggest seven species, jaguars, lions, tigers, leopards, snow leopards, and cheetahs to ensure not just their existence, but what we believe is the associated biodiversity. So why them? Because they're large and they're carnivorous. That means they need large prey bases, prey that needs to survive in well-conserved habitats and in large spaces. You can't fit too many big cats in one, what we call territory, because there's not enough food. So if we focus on them, it's kind of a shortcut to focus and saving all of biodiversity and including the habitats. Um, one key example of that is our jaguar, a much loved Latin American jaguar. And it's big, it's the biggest wildcat of the Americas and it used to range from south of the United States to northern Argentina. Now it's lost 50% of its range. And our strategy here is to save the remaining connectivity uh, of the species. And that's, uh, we do that through what we call the Jaguar Corridor Initiative. And how do we do that? Um, that involves working on land zoning and planning of development, where there's gonna be national parks, where in space of each country um, there's going to be extractive industries and where are there going to be mixed use areas where jaguars can pass without getting shot. That also means having boots on the ground combating illegal hunters and poachers and we do that through technology, we do that through working with local people and really creating bonds and an understanding that if we save jaguars we save ourselves, we save the biodiversity that sustains our very means of life. Um, and um, this is all uh, supported by science. So science is the base upon which we take our decisions, conservation decisions. Um, and um, we believe that the collective conscience of gamers is strong. And it's a, quite a strong alibi to help us with this mission. We can't do it alone. We as biologists, as conservationists on the ground, can't do it alone. So we need a critical mass, and that's where you come in. Um, so we, I do think this is a very exciting uh, strategy that we can really further the conservation of this glorious beasts. Thank you, and let's work together to save jaguars.
Hi, I'm Howard Quigley, and thank you very much for the invitation to present to Latinx. Um, it's a privilege, and I think it's also very important and fitting that we be talking specifically about the Jaguar. It is perhaps more culturally connected uh, for Latin America than, say, the tiger is in parts of the range, parts of its range. Um, it has a cultural connection to Latin America that I think we, that is very special and we'd like to be able to bring a little bit of that to you today um, as a reminder of what we need to do to conserve the species and why we need to conserve this species. The Jaguar Corridor was really, uh, to talk about the Jaguar Corridor, we really have to talk about in the history of how it came to be because I think that's an important part of it. Um, you know, the traditional way of conservation back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, even the 90s, was that you um, became focused on a particular landscape and you stayed right there at that landscape. And that was it. You, you, you didn't venture out from there and you're, you could count your successes with the number of animals that you conserved over a certain period. That all changed with the potential for corridors. Um, in the early uh, late 1990s and early 2000s, um, WCS, WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society in particular, brought um, uh, several jaguar experts together in Mexico City and then elsewhere later to talk about those core populations of jaguars that existed um, throughout their range from Argentina to Mexico. Um, and once those core populations were defined, it was really up to the biologist to figure out, okay, what are the most important areas? What is the best way to conserve the species? Well, um, Alan Rabinowitz and Kathy Zeller um, came up with an approach that I think was, uh, uh, is still exceptional. That is, here are the core areas, and there were somewhere around 90 of them, and at that time, there was being developed a new approach to conservation, and that was corridors. If you have these cores, how do you connect those? And genetically, how do you make sure that that transfer of, of uh, genetic material happens? That is, animals born here, it breeds here. So that creates much more a higher survival potential of both of those core areas. So what they took, what, uh, what Rabinowitz and Zeller did, was they took all of those, those core populations that we now call Jaguar Conservation Units, or JCUs, and then they layered onto that a way that we could look at the connectivity. That is, in those landscapes between those core areas, or JCUs, where was the best place? So they used a model that was developed at the time called Least Cost Path. And they then did the connections between all the all ninety of those uh, core areas. Um, it was a uh, it, it was at the time uh, a very special product. And I, I encourage you also to read the paper, the scientific paper that came out in two thousand and ten. Um, it gives you a very good overview of um, how the Jaguar corridor came to be. I also think that a, a really important read would be Chapter 10 of Indomitable Beast, a book by Alan Rabinowitz. In Chapter 10, he tells a little more basically um, how the Jaguar Corridor came to pass. Um, then, the big issue is how do you conserve the Jaguar in any of those core and corridor areas? Um, for cores, that really came down to looking at those JCUs to see if they were well protected. Um, for corridors, it's a different thing. But what we, ha what we have to look at first is what does that map look like? Um, this is perhaps one of the biggest, um, uh, biggest landscapes for conservation in any terrestrial environment for one species that is one of the most majestic, one of the most powerful images of wildlife any place in the world. So let's take a look at that map. The Jaguar Corridor from northern Mexico to uh, northern Argentina, this is the Jaguar Corridor that resulted from 
the use of those cores or JCUs, and then a program that allowed for the connectivity to show up. That is, we used and Rabinowitz and Zeller used the least cost path uh, or algorithm, let's call it, um, to be able to define those corridors. As you can see then, uh, uh, many of these corridors and cores or JCUs were consolidated into a fairly contiguous JCU, which is the Amazon JCU. In that were previously in the first maps uh, some 18 JCUs and somewhere around 30 to 35 corridors that are now consolidated into that, um, that Amazon JCU. But you can see this is this is this is the working place for the for saving jaguars, and you can do it in northern uh, Argentina, or you can do it in eastern Brazil, or you can go to Costa Rica or Mexico. But there are there's the map of what where you need to work, where we need to work to conserve jaguars in all 18 countries of of the jaguars range. Well. You can go to one JCU and two corridors, or you can do five corridors uh, with uh, five JCUs. But what if we thought bigger than that? What if we thought to do the entire range, or what we call the backbone? That is, what would be the most efficient way to make sure that Jaguar genetics and connectivity happened from northern Argentina to somewhere in Mexico? And we could create the most, the, the least cost path through the entire range of the Jaguar. This is what we call the backbone. We can't work everywhere, but we can find those places that create the, 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 the closest, the nearest path from north to south. And that's what the backbone is. Why don't we think bigger? Why don't we think about this as being a conservation program from Mexico to Argentina for the Jaguars, for Latin America. And that's what we're doing. That's what's called the Jaguar Corridor Initiative. The initiative is a way to take the Jaguar Corridor and then apply all of those tools that we know will work for conservation of Jaguars, whether it's in a JCU uh, or whether it's in a corridor. Well, what do we do in the, what are those tools? Well, that's, that, that's what we do on the ground. And that's what you can help us do to uh, support us, to find out where those important, important places are and try to see how we can work there. First, we go into, in a JCU, we look at what the threats are. The main thing here is we want secure populations. So we do what's called site security. And thus, most of these JCUs have a lot of protected areas in them. We assess the protected areas. We work with the protected area personnel to find out um, what they need. How do they keep poaching from, from happening within their park? And we then supply them with the training, the equipment to be able to do that. And that comes in a variety of forms that I won't go into now. And then the corridors. This is the most challenging place. Um, any one of these corridors is a human dominated landscape. So what do we do when we have uh, cattle ranching? What do we do when we have a lot of transportation corridors? Well, we look at the landscape within those corridors and we say, we need this tool or this tool. Um, if it's livestock raising, then certainly retaliatory killing is, is the most, um, the, the biggest threat. So what do we do? We go in and we develop with ranching, the ranching community a way that we can uh, help them from losing their cattle and make sure that jaguars can live alongside those livestock operations through some of the more than 10 different activities, conservation applications we call them, that will reduce the predation, their anti-predation techniques. Um, what do we do when there's transportation corridors? Well, we have ways that we can get jaguars either over or under those roads and design those roads so that they work better. What do we do when we have a, a, a wide variety of activities within a corridor? We start building community meetings, the monthly meetings. What are the concerns? How do we do? How do we do conservation in the cor corridor? How can we? What can we? coordinate as uh, operators within that corridor to make sure that there are places where jaguars can go through without being killed, without being hit on the road, all of those things. 
Um, what do we do if there's a high potential for, say, ecotourism in the, in the area? Then we go in and we try to work with landowners to build that ecotourism. This is the Jaguar Corridor Initiative, and it's not only a framework that, that, that Panthera got completely behind, and it's the basis and the foundation for our Jaguar program, but it now has been adopted by the UN, uh, UNDP roadmap for Jaguar conservation, the Jaguar 2030 roadmap. And through that roadmap, then, we now have 15 countries that, of the 18 range countries that have accepted that roadmap as a, a template for conservation of the Jaguar in Latin America. So this, uh, this, this uh, initiative is building and building and building and snowballing. Um, and we hope that in the future that uh, what we can do is be able to say that the Jaguar Corridor has secured the future of the jaguar and its its um, important role in the natural history of Latin America and in the culture of Latin America. If you want to know more about this, please go to our website and you'll find a copy of uh, this uh, overview of the Jaguar Corridor Initiative. And also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Eleanor Benowitz's book on the Indomitable Beast is a wonderful overview of a species that uh, is truly incredible. Thank you very much for your time today. I grew up in uh, northern Belize in a family that was very connected to the forest. That was our playground. That was where we got resources. Now, the landscape is really being transformed for monocrop agriculture. It's come to a point where we really need to band together to save this area. This morning, we're gonna be talking a little bit about something very close to my heart, the Maya Forest Corridor. Belize is world-renowned for its protected area system. But one of the gaps is the connection between those protected areas. What wildlife in particular would these corridors be especially important for? Jaguars are wide-ranging species that need large areas to sustain them. This corridor has been shrinking. Two decades ago, there was a huge corridor through the Belize. Now, that whole forest is gone. There's no other option. We know that once you fragment populations, it's the initial step to extinction. We are really out of time. This is basically the last remaining gateway for those animals to move. It doesn't get any clearer than this, that if the science has been done, if the science shows that this is an important area for connectivity of our protected area system and everything else that's important, then I think that, you know, we have to do something about this. Hola, mi nombre es Roberto Salón Pérez. Yo soy el director para Mesoamérica y Costa Rica de Pantera. Hoy les quiero hablar acerca de qué es lo que hacemos para conservar al jaguar, a otras especies y a su hábitat. Una de las cosas más importantes es poder medir cuál es el estado de sus poblaciones. Y esto lo hacemos viendo cuál es el estado en las áreas núcleo que frecuentemente coinciden con nuestras áreas protegidas y también los corredores que las conectan, porque sabemos que muchas de nuestras áreas protegidas no son lo suficientemente grandes para poder garantizar la supervivencia de la especie por muchos años. Esto está dentro del marco de la iniciativa del Corredor del Jaguar, que pretende conectar a las poblaciones de jaguar desde México hasta el norte de Argentina, o sea, a través de toda su distribución. Una de las herramientas que más utilizamos son las cámaras trampa, que son cámaras que se colocan en el bosque y se activan y toman la fotografía del jaguar y todos los animales que conviven. Otro de los componentes que usamos para poder medir la salud de las poblaciones es la genética. La genética nos dice mucho acerca de la diversidad. 
y sabemos que la, la diversidad es sumamente importante para que las especies puedan resistir y adaptarse a los cambios que constantemente están sufriendo, ya sea cambios ocasionados por el ambiente o por el ser humano. Porque así podemos medir la diversidad genética y también podemos medir el flujo genético, que es si las poblaciones están conectadas unas con otras. También trabajamos muy fuertemente en el tema del conflicto de felinos con ganado, que este se da frecuentemente cuando los jaguares o los pumas entran en el territorio eh, o salen de su territorio donde hay ganadería y muchas veces por falta de, de su comida natural en el bosque, por cacería u otros factores, se ven obligados a cazar ganado. Entonces nosotros trabajamos con el finquero mano a mano, decidimos cuáles son las, los cambios que se deben hacer en el manejo y les ayudamos. ¿Cómo les ayudamos? Bueno, hemos implementado cercas eléctricas, inclusive con paneles, paneles solares en lugares muy lejanos. También hemos hecho potreros de maternidad para proteger a los terneros y a las vacas preñadas. Y eh, en otros lugares como en, en Brasil, en Pantanal, hemos probado técnicas eh, como la utilización de búfalos de agua que protegen a, al, al ganado común. También es muy importante trabajar en el tema del impacto que puede estar ocasionando proyectos importantes para el ser humano como, como es la infraestructura. Carreteras, minas o proyectos hidroeléctricos son proyectos sumamente importantes para el ser humano, pero no están libres de generar un impacto sobre la naturaleza. Entonces Pantera trabaja para poder eh, medir cuál es ese impacto y poder hacer recomendaciones eh, de mitigación que puedan permitir que el proyecto y la naturaleza sigan conviviendo. Otro tema muy importante es las políticas de conservación. En las políticas de conservación trabajamos tratando de establecer acuerdos con eh, las agencias que están encargadas de la parte ambiental y hemos logrado varios acuerdos a lo largo de toda Latinoamérica. También políticas claras en, en cuanto a las cosas que se deben hacer para mitigar los impactos. Finalmente, un componente bien importante, sobre todo ahora en estos tiempos que nos afecta una enfermedad como el COVID, y hay menos turismo, hay menos gente cuidando las áreas protegidas. Pantera trabaja fuertemente eh, con las ONGs encargadas de co manejar las áreas o con las agencias ambientales, capacitando a los guardaparques, a los guardarrecursos, eh, con una herramienta que se llama SMART, que es de libre acceso y que permite coordinar los patrullajes, hacer los adaptativos, detectar los días en que los cazadores y las horas en que los cazadores entran a las áreas y cuáles son los puntos calientes en donde ellos están entrando y poder modificar el patrullaje y lograr detener esas acciones ilegales y garantizar que los jaguares, otras especies y sus hábitats sigan eh, estando con nosotros por mucho tiempo. Muchas gracias. In this note, we report the first record of swimming behavior for the Jaguarundi in Bahia La Graciosa, in the protected area of Punta de Manavique in Izabal, Guatemala. In February 2018, a Jaguarundi was observed swimming in an area with seagrass, where fish are usually found. It is probable that this individual was heading towards the forest area in the south of the community La Graciosa. This behavior may not be unusual, but has not been previously reported. However, another explanation could be that due to pressure from the fragmentation of its habitat, the species is now searching for resources in new places. This note is an important contribution to the knowledge of this little studied species and its behavior. It is necessary to promote more field research in Guatemala as well as document this type of observations, since the lack of knowledge about biodiversity can aggravate existing threats because it prevents us from taking appropriate management and conservation measures for the area and the species. Hola a todos, soy Ricardo Ortiz, investigador de Pantera Colombia. Hoy quiero hablarles de la iniciativa del Corredor Jaguar, una estrategia de conservación 
que busca proteger y asegurar el paso del jaguar en áreas productivas en todo su rango de distribución, desde México hasta Argentina. Colombia en particular es considerada un área clave para la conectividad genética de la especie y por su ubicación geográfica en el continente, actúa como un puente para ese paso obligado que tienen las poblaciones de Centro y Sudamérica. A raíz de esta importancia, Pantera Colombia viene trabajando en diferentes regiones del país de la mano con las comunidades, autoridades ambientales y gubernamentales en acciones que fortalecen la iniciativa del Corredor Jaguar. Una de ellas es la validación de campo, la cual consiste en realizar entrevistas a pobladores locales para determinar la presencia de la especie e identificar áreas claves y de interés para que el corredor sea viable. Otra de las acciones es monitorear mediante cámaras trampas las poblaciones del jaguar en zonas de interés y el uso e implementación de estrategias antidepredatorias que promueven la convivencia entre los productores y los grandes felinos. Por último, el trabajo de educación ambiental que se viene realizando con las comunidades a través de la iniciativa de Escuela Jaguar, un programa de, eh, enfocado a niños, jóvenes y docentes que promueve el liderazgo ambiental para la conservación del jaguar. En el Valle del Cauca, especialmente, hemos venido realizando un trabajo articulado con la autoridad ambiental en el plan de acción para las seis especies de felinos que habitan el territorio nacional, donde hemos incluido diferentes investigaciones con cada una de ellas. En 2017, por ejemplo, realizamos la validación de campo para determinar la presencia del jaguar mediante entrevistas e involucramos a la comunidad afro y campesina del Pacífico colombiano en el monitoreo mediante cámaras trampas para esta zona, donde logramos registrar nuevamente el jaguar dada la ausencia de registros desde el año 2014. El registro de este individuo a quien nombramos Pacífica reforzó el trabajo de las comunidades en el territorio para la apropiación de este a través de herramientas que permiten la convivencia con la especie. Por otra parte, en 2018, instalamos nuevamente cámaras trampas en el Valle Geográfico del Río Cauca, una zona que históricamente era habitada por el bosque seco tropical y que actualmente ha sido transformada por el monocultivo de caña de azúcar para estudiar a uno de los gatos más raros y poco conocidos en el continente americano, el yaguarundo. A través de esta investigación, logramos evidenciar que es el único felino que aún logra sobrevivir en este paisaje transformado y también propusimos corredores potenciales de esta especie junto a acciones de conservación para su protección involucrando al sector privado que en este caso son los ingenios azucareros. Finalmente quiero resaltar el compromiso que tienen algunas comunidades en la apropiación de sus recursos lo cual lo convierte en nuestros mejores aliados para la conservación y también resaltar la cooperación de algunas entidades públicas y privadas que fortalecen todas estas iniciativas para la protección de los felinos. De esta forma, evidenciamos que aún existen y hay más personas involucradas para la conservación de estos. De esta forma también nos permite contribuir a la protección de los ecosistemas y su biodiversidad y a los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible de la Agenda 2030 de las Naciones Unidas. Muchas gracias. Commonly, researchers estimate the number of big cats in the area, the density, by monitoring for three months using a grid of camera traps. We questioned whether these single snapshot estimates based on just three months of data could be considered a useful representation of science. And we tested this by monitoring continuously for a year in the Coxcomb jungle of Belize, creating 276 three-month separate density estimates. The results vary tenfold, from 0.5 to 5.3 jaguars per 100 square kilometers. And we demonstrated that this does not reflect true change in population size, but simply reflects changes in behavior of the jaguars, spending more or less time on the survey grid at different times of the year. We recommend that researchers extend survey time to assess the variation in density estimates across time thus improving the available information of cat distribution per site.
Hi, today I'm going to talk about the month of the Jaguar. The month of the Jaguar is an international festival created in 2018 to honor the late Dr. Alan Rabinowitz. Alan was fascinated by Jaguar culture. He was always talking about how this symbolism permeated different cultures all throughout the Americas. He actually coined the term the Jaguar Cultural Corridor to talk about this expansion and also the fact that a lot of these cultures, even though they had no contact with each other, they evolved totally separate, they had very similar elements and how and how they process Jaguar, Jaguar symbolism, you know, the mythology, the folklore. So it seems that Jaguars elicit very similar emotions and passions in human beings that interact with them wherever they may be. Generally speaking, the Jaguar has had great cosmological, ritual, and social importance. For many pre-Columbian cultures, the Jaguar was a being that could travel throughout the worlds. It was a, a balance between light and dark, between night and day, between life and death even. The Olmec, for example, who we consider to be the mother culture of Mesoamerica for the great influence that they had in the region, they built these immense Jaguar heads made out of rocks to represent the Nahuals, the spirits that would accompany the shamans in their trips through the underworlds. Uh, for the Maya, the Jaguar was the leader through the darkness. He would accompany the souls through the, through the realms of the dead. And for the Aztec, though they did share many elements with the Mayas in their, in their vision of Jaguars, they also created a whole elite of Jaguar warriors, which were these very powerful fighters that would wear Jaguar masks and Jaguar pelts. And they thought they would have the Jaguar's power by using these artifacts and they would terrorize their enemies just horribly, completely. Uh, for the Chavin culture from Peru, they thought the Jaguars were the perfect animal because it lived in complete symbiosis with nature. So as you can see, our ancestors, all these pre-Columbian cultures, they thought Jaguars were really, really important. They were a, just an, a part of their life in many, many ways. And although today it is still very present in a lot of indigenous cultures, and I think that we all still really appreciate the Jaguar's beauty and we use it in all sorts of art forms, in ornaments and fashion design and all sorts of things. We see Jaguars everywhere, or I do anyway, maybe because I just work with them, but they seem to be very present in our modern life. There still seems to be um, a disconnection, you know? Like there's, there's that missing link that our ancestors had, and maybe it's a general missing link, a general dissociation from nature. Uh, but I think that in, in many ways, we've lost, we've lost this respect that other people used to have. And that is exactly what the month of the Jaguar wants to do. We want to strengthen this link, this connection with Jaguars that we all have deep down inside us because of our culture, because of where we were born and who we are as humans. We want to help connect people, both from rural environments and from urban centers, with the Jaguar symbolism present in all Latin America because we truly believe that conservation is everyone's responsibility, not just scientists, but everyone as inhabitants of this world. Also, we want to help bring the message of the importance of conservation to a wider audience, because I think that a lot of people, even though they have an interest in the topic, once they start reading about the science, they get a little you know, dissuaded because science can be, science communication can be dry, difficult to digest, difficult to follow. So we would like to make, we would like to, to present the work that we do both in research and in conservation actions more digestible and easy to understand for a wider audience. Some of the events that we've done in the month of the Jaguar include theater plays, art exhibitions, art auction, uh, dances, uh, plays with children, science fairs, and we conduct all these different events in several countries in Latin America. Last year, we had 13 countries participate. This year, we're gonna have around eight, I believe. So it's a really big festival. It's growing every year, and we would love it if you could all join the way that you can get involved. This year is actually even easier because most of our events will be virtual. So all you have to do is follow us on social media, Mes del Jaguar, or on our webpage, mesdeljaguar.com, to find a full listing of all our events, all the things we're gonna be doing this month and participate, share, you know, get involved and come celebrate Jaguar culture with us. Welcome to Panthera TV. 
Today's episode is about how we work in Brazil with ranching communities to use electric fences to protect both the communities and the jaguars that live among them. My name is Rafael Hogestein and I am a veterinarian working since 2008 with Pantera on uh, feel it conflict resolution here in Brazil and in other countries of Latin America. One of the big problems here in the Pantanal and in the rest of Latin America and even the southern U.S. is the retaliation that the cattlemen do against the big cats, jaguars and pumas because of cattle predation problems. Pantera likes to work with the cattlemen, not against them. We are developing different anti-predation strategies and one of the more effective ones is the electrical fence. We made this little paddock as an exhibition to demonstrate the effectiveness of the electrical fence. And as you will see, this system is very effective to prevent the cattle going out and the cats going in. The electrical discharge is completely inoffensive for the cattle and for the cats. In fact, it's simply a deterrent, like if you would receive an electrical shock, you know, and you immediately jump off. So this system we have deployed in many countries in Latin America now. We have many ranches in Brazil, in Colombia, in Central America, in Belize, Costa Rica, Panama, where we have tried this out with great effectiveness. Hi, I'm Alison Devlin. I'm a postdoctoral researcher working with Panthera and the University of Montana. I'm studying jaguar movement ecology and behavior with Panthera's jaguar program. I'm working with teams throughout Latin America to better understand what drives jaguar movement across the landscape and how we can use those insights to better understand how we can mitigate conflict, especially in areas where people live alongside these big cats. Thank you very much for inviting us here today. I'm really excited to share some Jaguar facts with you, some of my field experiences, and to also talk with you about some of the technology that we use. Jaguars, like many other big cats, are naturally rare. They're difficult to study. So we need to use a variety of techniques to gain insight into their behavior, into what drives them across the landscape. Jaguars are the third largest felid in the world after tigers and lions and they're the largest felid in the Western Hemisphere. You can find jaguars from northern Mexico through northern Argentina, and they used to range into the southwestern U.S. There are still some individual jaguars that live in the U.S., but they're likely dispersers from the population in northern Mexico. It, there is potential for jaguar populations to reestablish and be viable populations in the United States, but that requires maintaining connectivity with that population in northern Mexico. What we're aiming to do at Panthera is to maintain con connectivity throughout their entire range. So where we have core jaguar populations identified from Mexico through Argentina, and we wanna keep a connection of corridors so individuals can move between those populations. Part of my work is to study the jaguars there, study their densities and population demographics and movement, and use that to understand how we can mitigate conflict with these predators. So jaguars are really fascinating big cats, not only for their biology and their ecology, but they also have this really deeply embedded meaning to many cultures throughout Latin America. Not only in current cultures are jaguars considered powerful or mysterious, but in indigenous cultures, they were worshiped as gods or are still considered messengers to gods. And in some practices, they're considered companions to shamans as they move from this world into the spirit world. So wherever you go throughout Latin America, there is this really, I think, intense connection to what jaguars mean. And it's something beautiful to understand the significance that jaguars carry with them, um, not only for the landscape, but also for the human cultures that live alongside them as well. So jaguars, like other big cats, are ambush predators, but they're unique among cats. So most cats will kill by using a stranglehold or they'll kill their prey by breaking the neck, severing along the cervical vertebrae. With jaguars, they have an unusually strong bite force, and they use their canines to puncture through the brain case of their prey, 
for a pretty much instant death to the prey animal. I've seen cattle that have a near perfect hole through the brain case um, that's been predated on by a jaguar. So their bite force is incredible. Um, they have this unique reputation. Their name, um, jaguar, derives from the Tupi Guarani word, yaguara, which means beast that kills its prey in one bound. So they've got this reputation of being very stealthy, getting to within maybe two meters, about six feet behind their unsuspecting prey before leaping onto their back and then biting through the skull. You may have seen some videos of jaguars hunting caiman. Caiman are relatives of alligators and crocodiles. Um, and one of our study animals went viral over YouTube a few years ago for predating on caiman in the Pantanal. And it's this incredible footage where he swims across this narrow channel, um, goes up onto the beach. This caiman is facing the viewers, doesn't even move until the jaguar sprints right on top of the caiman and it's over in an instant. It's incredible. Um, we have some individual jaguars in our study area that are so-called rock stars and <laughs> that's one of them. Um, you may have also seen some footage of jaguars in Costa Rica predating on sea turtles. So when sea turtles come onto the beach to lay their eggs, jaguars will leave the forest and hunt sea turtles on the beach and their jaws are strong enough to bite through the carapace. It's incredible the jaw strength that they have. Um, so definitely a formidable animal, but very shy when it comes to people. There is a local saying that the jaguar will only defend, he will never offend, meaning when he sees people, a jaguar typically will move away or hide. Um, I've had nearly two dozen encounters with jaguars on foot while working in both Belize and in the Pantanal of Brazil. And fortunately, in each of those encounters, um, either the jaguar has noticed me and I see the jaguar at the same time and the jaguar leaves the area. I'll just leave very calmly. Uh, an important point is to not run, not turn your back, but just very slowly back away until you're a safe enough distance to then move along. And I would leave the area alone after an encounter like that. Um, some of, I think, the most exhilarating experiences have been when I've encountered jaguars and the wind has been in my favor. There was just enough noise from the wind blowing through the leaves and the trees that the jaguar didn't hear me. The wind was blowing against me, so the scent wasn't carried to the cat. And I was able to observe a jaguar, for example, sitting in the middle of a path. And the jaguar was just looking up at the treetops as they waved in the wind. Um, it's been incredible and studying these cats because they are elusive they range over such great areas they um i think take you to some incredible places but i feel very fortunate to be able to study them welcome to panthera tv this episode is about amazing new initiative that we're undertaking to connect conservation with climate action uh, Conexion Jaguar is a project that we have here with two allies that are called South Pole and DISA. And with them we're working on a project to support landowners and communities within the Jaguar corridor with carbon credits. So that's giving them a sustainable finance mechanism so that they can keep conserving and restoring the land where they're living and where Jaguars are also living. We've been at it for about three years now and we've so far had seven projects in Colombia, in Peru, Brazil and we're just starting up in Chile. One carbon credit is one ton of avoided carbon loss or carbon that is captured. So we're working with the landowners and with the communities that have large amounts of forests or restoring forests so that they can be compensated for that. So basically the idea with Conexion Jaguar is that we're using the carbon credits as the mechanism to pay for the conservation. But as part of that, Panther has a value added to the carbon credits by doing what's called um, the, the biodiversity component for the methodology of climate, community, and biodiversity. So we do a baseline monitoring of, of the project to say what are the high value species that are in the area, whether they're endangered or vulnerable. So coming up this year in 2020, we have some really exciting projects. We have two projects here in Colombia in the Sierra Nevada Santa Marta, which is the most iconic um, area within Colombia. It's what they call the heart of the world because almost all of the ecosystems that are in Colombia are in that one spot. 
Uh, and so we'll be working with, there with two indigenous groups, with the Arawakos and the Kogi, uh, and we're starting just next month. Uh, we're also looking forward to a new project in Peru in the Amazon, in a really incredible area that has the largest open-air peatlands in all of the Amazon. Uh, we're hoping to start with our first project in Chile, working with pumas and uh, winyas. There, Colombia is bridging the gap between climate action and conservation.